uh, delighted to, in, uh, to introduce Roy Goodman, a uh, friend and a colleague, uh, the foreign editor for McClatchy Newspapers, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his essentially discovering the concentration camps in, in Bosnia in the early 90s. Uh, written a number of other books, uh, including the excellent book, How We, How we Missed the Story, which I think in many ways is um, an authoritative account, not only of how the United States, uh, both the media and the government, uh, missed the rise of the Taliban or didn't have the right set of policies in place to really deal with them, but also an authoritative of account on the Afghan and Pakistan side. So uh, really a deeply reported book on, on both on in the United States side, but also in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Often books tend to focus on the American side without really looking at the Afghan Pakistan side or vice versa. But uh, Roy's managed to weave both those stories together in this excellent book. So go ahead, Roy. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I must say, uh, <coughs> driving up my own driveway this morning was maybe the most hazardous thing I've done <coughs> in uh, years. Uh, <laughs> and I salute everybody else who had to do the same thing today. Uh, Peter, thank you uh, for inviting me here. And uh, it, it, this uh, location where some of the best debate occurs in uh, all of Washington. Um, and um, also for the work you've done on this subject, um, which is quoted throughout, as you know, <laughs> No, no, no. Um, uh, because there's it, really just a, certainly in the 1990s, there were just a handful of reporters who were uh, focusing on uh, South Asia and, uh, and on the growth of terrorism. Peter was one of them, um, one of those very few, and, um, uh, and I was not. Uh, so I have to start putting my cards on the table. Um, I was uh, myself uh, the European correspondent for Newsday in the early 90s, and um, it turned out really through the rest of the 90s, mostly covering the uh, wars uh, in the Balkans over the breakup of <coughs> what had been known as Yugoslavia. Um, this book, uh, you know, like most books, they never come out quite when you hope they would. This, uh, this was a little bit late. But sometimes um, arriving late uh, is, is useful because uh, it made me think as, as I wrote the um, conclusion and the, uh, and the introduction, um, about what is the relevance of Afghanistan uh, uh, and the events of the 1990s to uh, the United States today. And there's really a huge relevance. Uh, right now we're going through an uh, election cycle and um, some uh, dramatic events are happening, uh, you know, just in, in, a, in the last few days and, and certainly by March 4th. Uh, and we can say that we're now in the wind-down period for the uh, Bush uh, presidency. Um, it's not um, too much to say that a lot of people are, are drawing their judgments on Bush if they haven't already. I think the candidates are going to help us quite a lot in, for, in articulating what they think of Bush. Um, and uh, the epithets are going to flow. <coughs> um, obviously, a man who starts wars without having a clear idea how he wants them to end uh, is going to come in for some, some fairly strong censure. Uh, I saw The Economist this week uh, describing the Bush years as catastrophic. Um, well, the other connection, obviously, with the Clinton presidency uh, that's occurring right now is that Hillary Clinton is running uh, as the candidate of experience. Um, who, who experienced firsthand all of the uh, foreign policy and domestic policy issues of, the, of, of her husband's uh, presidency. Um, and it's, it's easy to forget, um, as we're looking forward to a new president, <coughs> that uh, the man that George Bush succeeded, in fact, the man who helped elect George Bush, uh, was um, reviled and derided in his day uh, in uh, many, many circles. Um, he was called a, f uh, a populist, he was called, which itself is not a derision, but um, a feckless uh, leader uh, who was, uh, feared the use of force, who feared um, uh, running the military and, rev and revamping the military and dealing with the military. Um, and his, whose term in office was characterized, uh, f lest we forget, by the permanent campaign. Um, and in many ways was, was wasted, was squandered <coughs> by the self-indulgence that gave rise to the Lewinsky scandal and then the impeachment proceedings. Um, 
But what's so interesting in foreign policy terms is that when President Clinton came to power, um, he, he basically was um, the first uh, Democrat since uh, Jimmy Carter, and uh, and he had uh, a lot of disdain for what had happened in the period um, between uh, Democratic uh, presidents, um, and basically his his motto was anything but Bush, in so many areas, uh, and I would like to say Afghanistan's one Afghanistan's one of them. Um, now, when President Bush came to power, this is Bush 43, <coughs> his position was uh, parallel, and that was anything but Clinton. And certainly, uh, wherever Clinton had done anything, I recall specifically going out with Colin Powell on the first trip to the um, <coughs> to the Balkans. Um, and uh, the aim of the White House then was basically to drop uh, everything in the one area that Clinton had really achieved something. Um, uh, it was to it was to pull out to pull troops out uh, to drop uh, uh, the commitment. So they have this in common, <laughs> the two presidents. In, in, the, in the practice of foreign policy, um, I could say that, uh, that neither one of our two uh, Cold War, post-Cold War presidents uh, seemed able to craft a foreign policy worthy of the name. Uh, both of them, I would say, put partisan interest uh, on the whole ahead of national interest. Under both administrations, politics did not end at the water's edge, but actually extended uh, almost everywhere. Now, there are exceptions, of course. Um, uh, as I say, in Bill Clinton, the intervention in the Balkans, uh, is, uh, they were very late, but they were effective. Uh, they were, however, not the president's initiatives. They were basically uh, pushed on him by uh, an aggressive secretary of state in that particular case. And he was pretty passive as they went forth. Um, and in the Bush years, there are also exceptions. For example, uh, the decision to start talking with North Korea after uh, abandoning the attempt to overthrow the government. And that was, uh, I don't think, George Bush's inspiration. That was something he was talked into. Um, so this is the overarching theme I would uh, like to just suggest uh, comes out of this book, and, and um, I, hope, uh, I hope I can prove my point. And that is uh, 15 years of ineptitude in foreign policy. Uh, now, this was, in, in all honesty, this was not the theme I started with when I, was, when I began my research. I was trying to look at the events that led to 9-11 from the perspective of the news media. We in the media <coughs> did not sound the alarm prior to 9-11, uh, nor did we, uh, nor after the event did we provide, it, to my mind, much illumination as to the root causes. And I'm not thinking so much of, of bin Laden and al-Qaeda because we really had some experts on that, but, but the country, the location, the context in which um, uh, al-Qaeda and bin Laden were operating. Um, and uh, my question was whether we could have uh, done better. Uh, of course, uh, the answer has to be yes, uh, but it would require a different attitude by news organizations uh, to uh, covering a subject that we uh, tend to shy away from, and that is covering small, faraway wars um, where it isn't clear whether there's an American interest at stake. Um, what I found in my research, uh, and my researchers here, in fact, uh, Patty, so thank you <coughs> for coming, um, was that there was next to nothing about what happened in Afghanistan in the 1990s um, and um, uh, in, in the American press, just spotty coverage at best. There were interviews with bin Laden, which drew little interest at the time when you look at, at the, uh, the ink that they drew in, other, in newspapers. Um, uh, uh, that weren't there pre present at the interview. There were occasional reports on the suppression of women's rights, which drew a little bit more interest. There was next to no coverage, <coughs> though, of the internal conflict in Afghanistan in the 1990s. <coughs> and you know, a country at war is actually the, the, the number one story and the number one event in that place is the war. Um, and so that, that you could not, uh, I, I searched other than Jane's Defense Weekly and Jane's Intelligence Review where one reporter, Anthony Davis, just was doggedly determined to uh, write about it. Uh, there was almost nowhere <coughs> that you could find even a kind of narrative of the war, no less an accurate narrative. <coughs> um, so uh, that was a problem in my research <laughs> because basically uh, at a fairly short, uh, inter uh, after a short interval I, dis I discovered there was almost no press coverage to critique. Um, so, so much for that idea as, uh, as a major uh, research theme. But it raised another question. Uh, if we were not there, the media, uh, w well, the U.S. government is omnipresent and uh, ubiquitous and it's, uh, it's got people everywhere and it's, and it's got the responsibility of uh, 
the world. So what was the U.S. government doing uh, about the events in Afghanistan in the 1990s? <clears throat> I'm not thinking of one agency or other, but the government as a whole. What was it saying about the threat that was emanating from Afghanistan? Um, and I'm thinking of, obviously, bin Laden and, uh, the Tal and uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, but, uh, you know, threats emerge from any, any place on Earth um, in ways we don't always know. And you want to know, what does the government know? <clears throat> was the US government rallying the public? Was it informing Congress? Was it alerting US allies? And I concluded after not a great deal of study, that there really was, as in with so many aspects of the Bill Clinton presidency, there actually was no foreign policy, capital F, capital P. There was a policy toward Afghanistan, and that was essentially one of passivity. Uh, the president, after uh, a, a period of time, after bin Laden set himself up, gave interviews, started making threats, and then actually delivering on threats, made a lot of tactical moves to get rid of bin Laden. Uh, there are a lot of books and articles of high quality that have focused on the efforts by the CIA, <coughs> by the counterterrorism experts in the White House and the State Department, <coughs> even by the Special Operations Forces of the U.S. military <coughs> to try to target bin Laden and uh, take him out. There have also been some excellent books on bin Laden and al-Qaeda, and I think of the Lawrence Wright book uh, in particular last year. Um, but the missing element in the discussion has been the overarching one, and that is foreign policy. Foreign policy, by my definition, involves assessing a situation based on every form of intelligence gathering, as opposed to covert operations, on the ground. What is really going on? What are the facts? What are the political facts? Who is fighting whom uh, and how? <clears throat> and then uh, determining are there, are there interests uh, of the United States at stake or potential interests, defining them, uh, clarifying them, reviewing them, and then setting the long setting of long-term goals <clears throat> in order to uh, to protect U.S. interests or, or safeguard them or strengthen them. The flexibility to evolve as events require. <clears throat> uh, and then when you have that in mind, when you have your strategy together, it's at that point that you assign a role to the so-called operational agencies, <clears throat> CIA, military, um, and uh, other agencies. Um, and you inform the public and the State Department to some degree. <clears throat> and you inform the public of what you're, what you're doing, you enlist the Congress, you seek the support of U.S. allies. Uh, foreign policy is crafted generally because it's really set up for this at the State Department. But it really is the direct responsibility of the President. Um, now, in the aftermath of 9-11, you will all, I'm sure, recall, as I did, that um, it was very interesting as to who was uh, held to be responsible for this uh, disaster. Um, you know, essentially the spotlight fell on the CIA and on the FBI, uh, maybe to a lesser extent on the U.S. military. <coughs> um, it was uh, very convenient, it seemed to me, to uh, blame the intelligence agencies for not providing perfect intelligence on the eve of uh, the events uh, and or arresting everybody who might have taken part in it in order to uh, prevent it from happening. But uh, my contention is that that the, this was, um, th they made tactical errors. The strategic error was, was really at the White House, the strategic and conceptual failure. Uh, and this was not just uh, one president, President Clinton, although he certainly deserves his, his uh, responsibility for it, but also President Bush. And while we're at it, the entire, so far as I can tell, nearly the entire foreign policy apparatus. Um, let me just give you a little bit of history, so I, I've, I think I've covered enough bases there. But I mean, th these people have stayed out of the uh, out of the discussion on the whole. You know, they've been they've been sort of out there as if they didn't have it, play any role in in what how the United States relates to the rest of the world. And as a matter of fact, it's central. This is the central role. Um, before I get to the theme, I should just recount a few dates, uh, although I know there's a very knowledgeable audience, just, so, just to put the dates in your, remind you of what the dates are. <coughs> uh, you've probably seen Charlie Wilson's War. Anybody who hasn't, uh, <laughs> please do. <laughs> it's, it's a good account of uh, uh, you know, an, an amazing event um, that was, uh, to a good extent, the congressman helped bring about um, the logistics that uh, generated uh, the um, or helped the, the, in the fighting and helped oust the Russians from Afghanistan in 1989. <clears throat> um, after that period, though, it was not as if it, it was not a it was not a clean victory. Um, 
uh, the Russians uh, and, and, and the United States has done this in places where it has been forced out, uh, found a way to stay behind. They, they named a puppet um, named Najibullah as, uh, as the leader and, um, and then started up something that's been compared to the Berlin Airlift in terms of the amount of weapons that they, 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 they sent in. Um, and uh, Najibullah stayed in power until 1992. Um, a State Department official was appointed, um, uh, I think it was 91, named Peter Thompson. He was appointed to be special envoy to the uh, Mujahideen groups, uh, who themselves were fighting among themselves and trying to decide who was going to take power and who, who would be in Kabul. And uh, he very quickly came to the realization that the one person that, they, that the U.S. could hope to have a good relationship with was Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, the famed guerrilla leader from the Panjshir Valley. And uh, Thompson did a number of things in the behind the scenes um, to assist Massoud. Um, and uh, I can't say that it was causal because Massoud himself was a, a gifted and, uh, and, and highly uh, motivated um, uh, military leader. In uh, any case, the, the upshot was that he, uh, he took uh, power um, uh, or he, he captured uh, Kabul. Um, <clears throat> the um, problem with Massoud is that, and by the way, the, nobody has yet written a biography of Massoud. It's kind of amazing for one of the great guerrilla leaders of the 20th century, one of the most interesting people. And I tried, I gave a, almost a whole chapter to, dis, to I, I came across a book of his letters to describing how he uh, fought the Russians in the 1980s. <coughs> and um, uh, it, it, was, it was really, the man was at his, at his last wits, but he, he always worked well under, under pressure. Um, but the, the, he was not a politician, and the, and the politician he linked up with, uh, Burhanuddin uh, Rabbani, <coughs> was um, uh, less than stellar in his uh, political qualities. Uh, they both uh, Tajiks, uh, a minority, <coughs> and to, you had to reach out to Pashtuns, the majority or the largest uh, single uh, nationality in, uh, or ethnic group in Afghanistan, and they failed. And the Clinton administration decided <coughs> that, uh, as they say, so in a sense, Afghanistan was a Republican victory, um, even though Charlie Wilson was <laughs> instrumental in getting the, the weapons uh, to um, the Mujahideen. It happened on Re Ronald Reagan's watch, <coughs> as did you know the the uh, Soviet pullout happened on uh, George Bush's watch, and the uh, and the. Uh, what followed that was the collapse of the Soviet Empire. I mean, this was this was helped pull the plug on on the whole Soviet Empire. So this was a great uh, historic development that occurred. Uh, it started in a way in Afghanistan. I can't you can't say that it, this was uh, causal, but it was certainly contributing. And it was a in a sense it happened on the Republicans' watch. And so uh, the Clinton administration, in a sense, uh, decided, and this is what people told me, at all costs to avoid following the Repo Republican path. They turned away completely from Afghanistan. They cut all aid. They cut all political support. And they dropped all interest. They didn't appoint a successor for Peter Thompson, for example, um, one person who would be able to bring together all of U.S. policy and deal with Afghanistan. <clears throat> uh, moreover, his top officials throughout the Clinton administration continually proclaimed neutrality in what was a continuing battle for power. So who was on the other side of Massoud, who was in Kabul? Uh, it was the biggest military threat was Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, uh, who uh, is a radical Islamist <coughs> uh, and a ruthless man, uh, who was backed by both by Pakistan and indirectly by the CIA, uh, because the CIA basically had uh, had uh, conceded that it didn't have the ability to influence events inside of Afghanistan uh, to a great degree after 1989, uh, but Pakistan did, and Pakistan asked for some IOUs to be uh, paid back. Um, so in a sense, you had w one branch of the U.S. government uh, supporting uh, the man in Kabul, and then you had another branch supporting uh, the guy who's trying to uh, topple him. Um, and so neutrality is made a kind of sense. It's a kind of elegant way of describing, uh, uh, you know, how you square the differences. Uh, or would, I guess in the Clinton years they used to talk about triangulation. <coughs> this was a kind of a triangulation on the ground. Um, uh, but neutrality also sends a signal to people. Um, it, it is a signal, <coughs> A, we don't really care. B, um, as for the people in power, we're not going to support them. Uh, you know, uh, so if somebody wants to, de to destroy uh, that, uh, that uh, government, uh, uh, feel free to. We are not going to object. 
Uh, and what happened, and so it, it signaled to Afghans that Massoud had no friends. Uh, certainly uh, the Americans were not his, his real friends. A vacuum took hold, warlords set up fiefdoms, corruption spread, and in September 1996, the Taliban marched into Kabul. <clears throat> now, bin Laden, who had fought in the anti-Soviet resistance and had helped uh, organize the Arab volunteers, had actually returned to the country before the Taliban came to power. He was there in May of 1996, and they came into Kabul in September. <clears throat> the Taliban were, uh, from everything I could tell, wary of uh, bin Laden, but he knew Afghanistan well uh, from the days when he had been fighting in the jihad and, and, and organizing uh, the uh, volunteers uh, from Arab countries and Muslim countries to come there. And he was waiting for his opportunity <coughs> to act and to, uh, to influence the Taliban. Um, in 1997, this is uh, in not quite a year after the, they came to power, the Taliban attempted, with support from Pakistan, blatant, public, diplomatic, military support, to capture Mazari Sharif, which is the biggest uh, city of the north. They failed miserably. In fact, the, the Taliban stepped into a huge trap. Uh, thousands of their men were captured. They were later killed. And that was bin Laden's opportunity. Uh, he saw uh, that uh, the, the Taliban didn't really know how to fight a war. They, you know, throughout, throughout all of their wars, they were, their, their troops were conscripts. Uh, they were untrained. They fought in flip-flops. Uh, why? So that they could do the prayers, because the Taliban were a super uh, orthodox religious uh, organ, uh, uh, movement. And um, bin Laden basically uh, provided several of his top officials to help guide the Taliban and reorganize their forces. He provided money. He provided vehicles. Um, and, and he provided fighters, because his training camps were, um, were always there, even in the, in the years he wasn't there. And he revived them, and he trained um, uh, Arabs to be volunteers to fight in the internal war uh, versus uh, against the um, Northern Alliance or United Front of Ahmad Shah Massoud. Uh, Massoud survived his uh, withdrawal from, from uh, Kabul. He um, went back to the Panjshir Valley <coughs> and, uh, and fought on there until just before 9-11. Uh, so in 1998, August of 1998, they captured Mazar. It was a bloodbath when the Taliban came in. They, they executed as many innocent civilians as they had lost soldiers the year before. I devoted about at least a half a chapter to what happened in Mazar in 1998. Why? Because I could not find a complete account in the American media. In fact, the paper of record, the New York Times, gave it at most one paragraph, this, this massacre of Mazar-e-Sharif in 1998. It was organized from the top. It was brutal. At least 2,000 people, innocent civilians, were slaughtered as I say, got no coverage at all. Now, the reason it didn't, or one reason it didn't, was that two days before the capture of Mazari Sharif, bin Laden launched his attacks on two embassies, two US embassies in East Africa. <clears throat> that obviously uh, distracted the attention of the press, and, it, and it's quite, quite a reasonable and understandable thing that it did. Secondly, the, the press was not allowed into Mazar when the, cap, when the capture occurred. In fact, it was an absolute no-go zone <clears throat> from the time it occurred, August of 98, until at least December and maybe January of the following year. So it was very tough. The only way you could actually cover the slaughter of Mazari Sharif, the Taliban takeover, and by the way, they, they took over the Iranian mission and executed everybody, or they, they thought they did. Actually, two people survived. But the only way you could, you could cover that actually for a journalist was to talk to refugees. And it took refugees up to an entire month on foot to come out of uh, Mazari Sharif and uh, land in Pakistan. The UN High Commission for Refugees uh, discovered what had happened, and um, a man named Rupert Colville, a very brave guy, went around, c collected the testimony, and then went to every journalist he could find in, in Islamabad uh, and urged them to write a story about it. And to my knowledge, only one did uh, in a serious way, and that's Dexter Filkins, uh, who was then with the Los Angeles Times. So that, this brings me to the story that we missed, <laughs> the story uh, of my title. <coughs> uh, at a certain point, um, you could say, that uh, Osama bin Laden hijacked the Afghan government. Um, that is to say, a terrorist took control of a state, or the key elements of the state. Um, we know after 9-11, because this is where I got the idea, frankly, that it had happened. It was it's a common agreement in foreign policy circles that it happened. Um, but I, as far as I could tell, almost nobody ever spoke about it before 9-11. Um, 
and I think back as a journalist, uh, because uh, you know we think in head terms of headlines and stories. Um, imagine if, if at the moment it had happened, um, uh, and this is kind of a, it's a judgmental thing, but still you could say at a certain point that Bin Laden really took took control. Imagine the headline had we gotten this story at the time it had occurred. Um, I, I can tell you it would not just be a headline. It's a story that uh, I and I think any journalist would have come back to again and again and again until uh, we got all the facts out, until we embarrassed the government probably into uh, doing something about it. Um, and the, the argument in the book is that this turning point was probably, and this is a, a best guess, was about August of 1998. Um, now, uh, I, I'll go into the reasons why in just a minute, but I should first uh, digress to mention uh, that uh, the attacks by bin Laden on East Africa uh, obviously uh, led to a counter uh, by uh, the United States. And Clinton's initial response was almost right out of the George Bush uh, playbook. Uh, he attempted by military means basically to assassinate uh, the author of the embassy bombings. Um, and he, uh, of course, it, 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 this is August 20th. The uh, bombings were August 6th, I think. Um, <clears throat> and he missed. Uh, then he uh, launched other means, covert means. He used uh, uh, the, the CIA at, at various points, contacted uh, Massoud, and uh, tried to get his forces to, uh, to assassinate bin Laden. And you know from Steve Cole's very, very careful um, charting of those uh, attempts, <clears throat> that for, for some reason or other, every single one of them uh, was stopped uh, just before it was about to uh, take off, out of fear that it was going to go awry and was going to embarrass the United States. The counterterrorism shop at the White House uh, and its, its parallel at the State Department also tried uh, to support some sort of military force uh, to uh, eliminate bin Laden. The administration attempted uh, also through diplomatic means, and this is one of the focuses of the book, um, to get the Taliban to hand over bin Laden. And the problem here was that the diplomatic means, which entailed sitting down with the Taliban, sitting, uh, exchanging messages with them, having some ridiculous phone conversations in the middle of the night, um, were in no ways connected or coordinated with the military and covert means. Um, so, and, and this is something I've realized, uh, and, and uh, Bill Goodfellow here is here recalls the book I did on the um, <coughs> on Central America in the 1980s. Uh, that one of the huge problems in dealing with the Sandinistas that the uh, that the uh, Reagan administration had was that it didn't coordinate its diplomacy with its use of force. Um, coercive diplomacy is really the only uh, kind of diplomacy that's going to work. And it's also the only kind of coercion that's going to achieve real aims. And you, have, you can have coercion without diplomacy, you can have diplomacy without coercion, uh, and they're bound to fail. And so in the, in the case of uh, the Clinton administration, they had coercion without diplomacy, namely they, they fired these missiles without really thinking of what the, re the outcome was going to be. <clears throat> and then you had um, diplomacy without coercion. You had a whole series of talks with the Taliban about uh, to, trying to get them to hand over bin Laden. Um, and in fact, the coercion probably was counterproductive. It probably drove bin Laden and the uh, Taliban much closer to each other. There were at least 10, uh, and meanwhile, there were at least 10 times the administration approached the Taliban um, for, in a diplomatic way. Uh, what the president didn't realize at the time, um, and maybe there's no way he could have because he had nobody really focusing on the political developments in Afghanistan um, at that time in 1998, was that bin Laden had made himself indispensable uh, to Mullah Omar. Uh, there was no way after the conquest of Mazari Sharif, with the aid of bin Laden's guidance, his funding and troops, that <coughs> Omar could have ditched him. Um, now, the reason, as I say, Clinton didn't recognize that was that he had devoted no resources to following uh, events in Afghanistan. It was as if, as if he was in denial, as if he just wanted to turn away from the place completely. And this, this goes for the CIA. Um, this goes for the fact he didn't have a single uh, official uh, responsible for Afghanistan in his administration. It was basically handled through the um, U.S. Embassy in, um, in Islamabad in Pakistan as a subset of what they were doing with Pakistan. Um, and, uh, and, and he also didn't have, he, and he didn't have a strategy. Uh, and the other thing he didn't have was us, the, <laughs> the independent media who can go out there and sometimes uh, uh, uncover a story, look for the context in which it's happening, stick with it, 
uh, uh, put it on the front page uh, or at the top of the news and, and continually um, bring it before the public. That didn't exist. Uh, it was early 1999 when the top official of the State Department who dealt with South Asia, and this is Rick, Rick Indifer, the former journalist, by the way, <coughs> uh, concluded that Omar and bin Laden have effectively become one. Another top State of Department official said bin Laden has hijacked the state, hijacked the Taliban movement. This was like early 1999. Now, uh, the boss at the State Department at the time was Madeleine Albright. It's true, she was rather preoccupied with the Balkans at that time. But uh, interesting about uh, Madeleine Albright was that whatever Rick Interfirth concluded on this uh, not minor issue, she couldn't remember it. Uh, she told me that Interfirth had probably told her about this, but she said, I can't remember exactly. Uh, and it turns out that, as far as I could tell, Interfirth didn't tell anybody else in the U.S. government. The CIA had concluded roughly at about that time that, the, that the Afghanistan had become a terrorist-sponsored state, close to but not quite the same thing as a state that had been hijacked. No one bothered to inform the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the top policy official responsible for the region concluded that a terrorist had hijacked a state. No one told the intelligence committees in Congress, <coughs> the foreign relations committees on both sides of the uh, Hill really were not following th that issue in this way very closely. Uh, the administration didn't raise it in public, and the public didn't raise it with the administration. Now, so in other words, it, it took months. If, if the hijacking occurred in August of 98, it took until early 99 uh, before it really became realized in the, um, in the administration. Um, and, and it was almost not like embarrassing. They kept on sending um, envoys into, to Islamabad to see the Taliban representative. And this guy, Mullah Jalil, would turn up at the ambassador's uh, residence uh, and sit down with uh, somebody from uh, the State Department. And he'd put his feet up on the table uh, and pick at his toes. Um, and, uh, you know, they also had nuts and food out there. And um, the ambassador, <laughs> Bill Milo, said he just <laughs> didn't know quite what to make of it, but this, was the, this is who the Taliban uh, are. And uh, he, just, uh, he just carried on. Um, now, why do I say that, in fact, it happened in August 98? And that, it, and that it took a good six months. Well, it just look at, it turns out, all you had to do to understand Mullah Omar's uh, position on handing over bin Laden was listen to the radio <laughs> or read the newspapers in Pakistan. Um, he, uh, in, it was August, just before the attacks of August 20th, 98, Omar declared, <coughs> and this was on radio, we will never hand Osama over to anyone, and we will protect him with our blood at all costs. Um, <coughs> Now, uh, turn the clock ahead, six months to the beginning of 1999. February 15th, uh, Omar told uh, the reporter Rahimullah Yousafzai, uh, a Pakistani reporter based in Islamabad, who was also a BBC uh, uh, reporter there, <coughs> quote, we cannot go back on, a and this is a, a complete explanation, we cannot go back on Afghan, Islamic, and Pathan tradition. Uh, Pashtun Wali is another way to put it. <coughs> According to those traditions, we owe protection to anybody who has taken refuge with us. And bin Laden is not just anybody. He fought with us. And then he goes on to say that he would sooner lose his country than give up bin Laden. He said, half my country was destroyed by war, and I would not mind if the remaining half is destroyed in trying to protect our guest bin Laden. That's pretty definitive, um, considering that they never talked to, to Omar because he wouldn't receive non-Muslims, and they probably didn't, Americans didn't want to take big chances in going to Kandahar. Any case, um, pretty, uh, and, and as I say, an unchanging message throughout those whole six months. <clears throat> so when that happened, uh, logically speaking, U.S. policy toward uh, the Taliban and towards Afghanistan had to change. In other words, the fusing had occurred. You couldn't distinguish bin Laden from, uh, the, from the Taliban. Um, and I guess to, to the extent that the Americans recognized something had changed, uh, you could say there was a change of tack, a change of tactics, as a matter of fact. Um, instead of, um, of asking the Taliban anymore, although they did keep up uh, mess sending messages, what, they, what the U.S. government did was to follow the lead of the terrorism, this is Michael Sheehan at the State Department, at the terrorism, counterterrorism shop at the State Department, and they decided to draft, and this is the guy, the counterterrorism expert at the State Department is drafting economic sanctions uh, uh, that will be uh, submitted to the United Nations and, uh, and, and that was r r relatively easily uh, approved later in that year. That was their response. 
Um, but really, in, in, in reality, that was an absolutely inadequate response. <clears throat> I mean, Afghanistan was one of the poorest countries in the world, led by ideologues who didn't care what happened to the economy. So, so much for economic sanctions. Uh, for there to be change, there had to be real pressure against the Taliban. And in this case, the, uh, you had to go to uh, having exhausted diplomacy and, and you know, give them credit for having exhausted diplomacy. You then have to go to the next step, and that is coercion to back up the diplomacy. And that meant uh, probably cutting off the Taliban uh, routes of supply, which mostly went through Pakistan, um, and probably applying military pressure using uh, the forces of Ahmed Shah Massoud, not just to go after bin Laden, but to go after the Taliban. Um, now, in order to do that, you actu actually had to convince the Pakistanis to get on board. <coughs> um, I mean, Pakistan was also su supplying a lot to uh, the Taliban, manpower, uh, you know, volunteers coming in, um, uh, and some trained, ammunition, training, and weapons. The, there was a weak civilian government uh, then headed by Nawaz Sharif, a figure who's now come back, as we know, and there was a very powerful military. Um, but it's very interesting, at the time of the Al-Qaeda attacks on the U.S. embassies, there, there was also a very level-headed chief of staff at the, in the Pakistan military. His name is Jahangir Karaman. And I talked to him. I asked him, if, if, if the Americans had come to you at that point and said, we've got to change policy, can Pakistan come on board? His answer was, uh, they didn't, but they should have. He said, we could have had a considered engagement, quote-unquote, policy. The argument that would have swayed the Pakistan army, he said, was, that, was this. American sovereign a assets had been attacked. Bin Laden uh, had shown that he has the potential to strike targets around the world. Um, the Taliban and bin Laden together were a threat to Pakistan itself. So in other words, to make this a case of Pakistan's own interests being at stake. Uh, but it would require, as I say, an articulation by the United States of a strategic concept that would be both to strangulate bin Laden and force the Taliban to hand him over and to change their policies. The discussion really should have occurred in August uh, at that time, uh, but it could have maybe even occurred later. But in any case, that was the moment it, it should have happened. Karamat uh, gave up his post in October of 98, a couple of months after the cruise missile attack. Uh, now, the agency that would have applied, would have approached uh, Karamat was uh, the commander-in-chief of uh, Central Command, um, that would be Anthony Zinni, I think, at that point, um, or somebody from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But uh, interestingly enough, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were not aware that, uh, that a terrorist <laughs> had hijacked a state because nobody really told them. The pre you know, in other words, this never got up to the up the the chain to the president. So, and and the president, uh, or maybe it did, and maybe he just didn't want to know. But in any case, he didn't tell his own government, starting with the military. And this is the source of so many things that went wrong because the Joint Chiefs were never on board a get tough policy uh, on the Taliban. Um, uh, now, as I say, the president himself took the eye of, off the ball, but. Um, a president at that moment had to set priorities, and the priorities um, uh, were, were these. What is most important? Is it curbing the Taliban and their special guest, or is it punishing Pakistan for having de detonated a nuclear device in April of 1998, which is just before the uh, August events? <clears throat> now, what President Clinton decided to do was to listen to leading congressional Democrats among them the current Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and, and uh, ex-Senator John Glenn, um, and to take the route of punishing the Pakistanis for this, uh, for this nuclear <coughs> detonation, which, as you know, happened in parallel with, with the Indians. What did this do? This riled up the Pakistani military still more, and it made it impossible, really, to work with them. Relations got very tense, and every time somebody brought something to the U.S. military leadership about how we could go in there and help Massoud, whom the Pakistanis hated, or we could uh, send in, um, uh, let's say, a uh, special operations team, uh, which would require support, which would have, you have to overflow uh, Pakistan, um, any number of other steps that could have been taken, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff basically said no. Uh, or they, they resisted, maybe they said yes, and then they came up with all the problems that would, would develop, and uh, they decided essentially uh, in every way they could to block it. Um, Peter mentioned to me, uh, reminded me uh, the other day of the article uh, called Showstoppers by Richard Schultz, a very fine uh, analysis of just this very thing, you know, why didn't we use the special operations forces we have? 
<coughs> uh, but he notes, in, as I say, that the Joint Chiefs had, had blocked, um, the, the other thing that they blocked uh, all the time was anything Richard Clark from the terrorism, counterterrorism shop at the White House proposed. According to Richard Schultz, they, they blocked because they felt that he was a screw loose, he didn't understand the big picture. And you know, operating in the counterterrorism shop at the White House, this is a very small operation. You don't have a huge bureaucracy behind you. You don't command one of the agencies of the government. You're just sort of there in a kind of a, se in a very secretive uh, mode where you cannot t go to the public and, and tell them what's going on. So you have to ask how Richard Clark, you know, with all due respect for, for his, his, his judgment, he had things right, could ever have carried off uh, any operation just in the place that he, he stood in the bureaucracy, unless the president himself took it over and made it his theme and, and made it a public theme and then brought all the rest of the bureaucracy on board, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Interestingly enough, by the way, speaking of the Joint Chiefs and, and the sink uh, in, um, in uh, CENTCOM, you know, they never devised a contingency plan for uh, intervening, intervening in Afghanistan. Uh, not until after 9-11 did they draft it. About a month, month afterwards, they were working on it very hard. So my point here is that, um, is that the president um, at the time, Bill Clinton, basically put his political interests, and, and this is not atypical. Those of us covering foreign policy in the Clinton administration can remember that next to every issue uh, had its own politics, and it always does in Washington. But on the whole, he turned over uh, the leadership in, on these issues to, to somebody or other who was a constituent, either a uh, group of Democrats on the Hill or somebody outside, but somebody who, who would, uh, in a sense, be, be a political ally for him. Rather than starting off by asking the question, what's in the national interest, what's the strategy, uh, and, and how are we going to carry this out? Um, Republicans, I dare say, at that time were also pushing their own party interest over what I would call the national interest. <coughs> um, they, uh, uh, you know, impeaching Bill Clinton was their number one uh, goal and getting even for, uh, I guess, for the Nixon uh, impeachment. Um, uh, you know, long memories, uh, uh, bad timing, uh, and uh, something that totally preoccupied the country. And by the way, Bill Clinton as well. If you read Bill Clinton's memoirs and you ask and you look for uh, Afghanistan, the Taliban, and so on, you know, there's a few pages here and there devoted to it. But then you go into a very long screed about the Lewinsky uh, issue. So you can see where his mind was. Um, so uh, what I found so interesting, though, was at the time that, th that Clinton launched these, this failed cruise missile attack against Pakistan, who were the people who publicly supported him and called for more? It was the same conservative Republicans trying to impeach him, Newt Gingrich and others. Um, another ally that he could have found, because the, the Clinton people tell us all the time, well, we didn't, uh, the public wasn't ready for tougher action against Afghanistan at this time. It was after 9-11. Um, who are the other allies? Very interesting, interesting. The feminist majority, Ellie Smeal and company, they had gotten interest in Afghan interested in Afghanistan because of the mistreatment of women. They sent people over to interview refugees. You know, this is such a simple thing. Anybody can do it. Any journalist can do it. Any NGO can do it. Any, any, anybody, uh, any high school student or, or graduate student uh, can, can interview refugees and ask, by the way, why are you a refugee? What happened to you? Well, in, a, in the course of talking to refugees by the hundreds and, the, and doing up their own internal reports, the feminist majority reached the conclusion that it is not just mistreatment of women that's the problem in Afghanistan. It is the whole Taliban. It, this is a group that has to go. And they sat down with Bill Clinton um, at one point in the, in the White House and, and pleaded with him. They came, he came up with ten points, of which women, women's issues were about number five, and basically said to him, it's time for you to do something about the Taliban. And you know what Clinton did was one of them mentioned that there was a, um, you know, the, the case of a girl who uh, wanted a, a visa to the United States to study and could not get it. And of course, we were taking in about five refugees a year at that point. And they pointed out to him that there was a total mismatch between the fact there are four million Afghans abroad and there's just, uh, and we're taking in about four or five a year. So what did Clinton do? He said, we'll give her a visa. <laughs> And he, and he focused completely on this one case and on, and on helping individuals, and he missed the whole big picture, and this was not an accident. Anyway, so much for the feminist majority, but they, they were a, a group that also had a big membership and could have gotten people's interest. Okay, so um, this is basically um, my point of conclusion here. Um, look, the, the moment was missed um, under, um, under Clinton um, because Karamat's departure, um, his successor was Pervez Musharraf, he had very powerful ambitions. <clears throat> Within months, he was organizing an, an assault into Kashmir. Nawaz Sharif was under American pressure um, to uh, both 
sever relations with the Taliban and to rein in Musharraf. Uh, he did rein in Musharraf, and then Musharraf ousted him, as you know. Um, so soon, uh, so there was no card the Americans could play. Even these economic sanctions, the, the Pakistanis did their very best under Musharraf to undercut them. And I have some evidence in the book of just how that happened. And at the end of the Clinton administration, when the USS Cole was attacked, um, the uh, president knew because everybody told him that bin Laden was behind it, <coughs> but he, he wanted absolute, he, want, he wanted it chiseled in stone b before he acted and basically turned it over to the Bush administration. Now, under Bush, just very quickly, as I, say, and as I said at the beginning, things did not change that much. He, he and his top aides had no interest, no curiosity in Afghan about Afghanistan, no interest in getting even for the coal, no concern about a terrorist takeover of a state. Um, and, and, and this really is almost still the case in the Bush administration, but certainly for the first three years. <coughs> um, they had another agenda. And the agenda basically was to walk away from uh, international obligations, including uh, international uh, rules, uh, rules of, of war. Um, and 9-11 gave them the opportunity to seize on and carry out this agenda. Um, they operated, uh, the idea was not to consult Congress as they went along, which is, as I say, one of the fundamentals of foreign policy is you've got to have Congress on board so that you can make a bipartisan approach. And they obviously kept everything they could secret from us in the media and from you in the public. Um, coalition negotiations, the way that you bring in your allies in order to uh, deal with a major problem that's a common problem, um, did not uh, figure into their thinking. Um, and instead they went a unilateral course. Uh, Fear-mongering, demonizing opponents, uh, basically President Bush uh, was seeking in doing so uh, partisan advantage, <coughs> using foreign policy uh, for, for narrow gain rather than for the national, nation's interests. <coughs> um, you know, Democrats, uh, one has to say something about the Democrats. Uh, did they go back and look at what happened at 9-11 and what was the responsibility of uh, the Clinton administration? Uh, and what, and, and, uh, what, what lessons did they want to learn from this? And the a simple answer is no. When I asked Madeleine Albright, would you do anything differently? Uh, she basically said to me um, that they did everything they could. And they thought they did the right things, it's just that they failed. <coughs> Um, so doesn't failure actually call for some, uh, for some soul searching uh, uh, after an event like that? And instead, I think that the Democrats feeling so, uh, so under pressure, uh, so uh, uh, unable to defend themselves, went along with next to everything uh, Bush asked for, including the war in Iraq. Final conclusions, two presidents did not regard Afghanistan as a serious place, um, but it turns out Afghanistan actually matters. Two presidents are responsible for the strategic failure there, and so is the foreign policy apparatus at the State Department. Democrats should undertake a, a lessons learned exercise before they return to power so they don't do this again. And we in the media should start asking Hillary Clinton, who claims to have experience, uh, okay, what are the lessons of your uh, experience? What did she learn from her husband's failure? <coughs> Foreign policy as a political football has been the characteristic of this era, these last 15 years. It has put us into dire straits. There really is no substitution for what we had in the Cold War era, which is a long-term bipartisan approach. We must take foreign policy out of poly party politics. We have to focus on places, small obscure places where we don't think we have a huge national interest because this is the sole superpower and, and it just turns out that those places uh, turn into uh, hell holes. Um, covert ops, military ops, quick fixes, surgical strikes are not going to work unless they're part of a broad spectrum foreign policy. Counterterrorism um, is too important to leave to the counterterrorism shops. It's something really that we should all be interested in. The news media, well, we have got to get more active. We, the media, were caught off balance by 9-11. We hadn't followed the story on the ground, nor did we reconstruct it. <coughs> uh, we didn't know anything about the internal war, the relationship between Bill bin Laden's fighters and the Taliban. Now, President Bush didn't know either, but he just assumed they were all the same thing, and he just locked them all up in Guantanamo without even a hearing as, as they were arriving to find out who they were, what, what was the fight they were involved in. <coughs> and um, he just wanted to know, are you gonna, is bin Laden going to attack us uh, next week? So what happened was, as a result of 
of uh, the heavy-handed approach in Afghanistan, I think Bush, President Bush has made things worse. Instead of a Taliban in Afghanistan alone, there's now a Taliban in Pakistan as well, whose aim is to destabilize that government and create a haven for jihad, jihadists. So we in the media, as I say, uh, coming back to my original theme, uh, should we think of what, 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 what we've done and what we can do better? Uh, as I said, this is a story we missed. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Roy. And um, I, um, if you ask a question, please identify yourself. I'm going to take advantage of my role as moderator to ask you. Uh, one is a clarification. What, what did we actually do when the Pakistanis um, uh, tested their nuclear device? I mean, what was the actual? You mentioned that we took um, some kind of punitive action. Um, I cannot recite precisely what the steps were, but uh, any, uh, any aid uh, that was in the pipeline was basically cut. Right. Uh, the military cooperation was, was put in a deep freeze. Uh, everything was done to, uh, to basically um, turn them into pariahs, whereas, of course, <laughs> the Indians had just done the same thing. But uh, there was worry, and it's legitimate worry, that, that, uh, about the safety of nuclear devices. And, and, this was, and there was a fear of a, uh, of a, a conflict between India and Pakistan and using nuclear weapons. And this is, a, this is no minor thing. It's a thing that, uh, however, it arises out of political facts. Um, and it is not something that you can curb with sanctions. You've got to actually work with the two sides in whatever way you can to make sure that the political frictions are minimized. And um, uh, sanctions is a favorite uh, tool of, uh, of successive Congresses and many administrations. <clears throat> and on a the whole, they, uh, they miscarry. Um, you know, I, I have long thought that if Al Gore was in the White House on 9-11, the Democratic Party would be out of business. And um, because the whole thing would have happened on their watch, which is a way of asking your assessment of who actually bears more culpability. You say that you're sort of giving equal culpability to Clinton or to, or to Bush. I mean, given the fact that the coal explosion happened three months into Clinton's term, he's about to go to the exits, and then there was no response for nine months, doesn't that suggest a little bit more culpability on the Bush, uh, not, not necessarily Bush personally, but his whole national security apparatus? Well, one of the interesting things I found in the 9-11 report <coughs> Uh, and then talking to officials was that um, at a certain point, um, as the CIA was reporting in on the information uh, uh, about the uh, who was responsible for the coal, <coughs> um, Clinton just uh, ordered everybody to stop uh, putting everything in writing, and he wanted only uh, mm -hmm. verbal briefings. Um, and uh, he insisted on a standard of uh, culpability that you know you might be able to achieve in a court of law, but even there, everything is a judgment. You know, he wanted really he wanted it documented. Um, he, he Karamat uh, told me that he had heard from, I think it was Tommy Franks, in fact, <coughs> uh, that um, I guess he and he was the incoming uh, commander in chief for um, CENTCOM. <coughs> that Franks said. And this was, this was uh, in Clinton's last days. Make no mistake, we know for sure that, uh, that it was bin Laden, and we, in the next administration, will act on it. Anyway, I got to Franks and asked him whether that was, in fact, the, something he said and believed, and he said absolutely it was true. And of course, he, he, in the next administration, they decided to put other things at, uh, higher on their list of priorities. Um, for example, um, missile defense. That was a much more important uh, thing in the minds of the uh, Bush administration. Um, they, well, you, everybody knows the story of how they didn't want to hear from Clark. Uh, look, the, the, the President, Bush, uh, President Clinton, even with a disputed election outcome, was still the president. We only have one at a time. <clears throat> and, the, and the president cannot slough off something that happens on his watch when he knows who did it and when he knows what should be done about it. You cannot simply put it off to your successor. Uh, I, I don't know that uh, there's any, uh, any way to get around that. Mm. <clears throat> uh, and while the Bush administration had a responsibility, they also uh, are, are newcomers. You know and I know how long it takes a new administration to come up to speed on next to anything, even to get their people in place. Um, it's usually May or June or even July before you get your cabinet officers all in place, no less your sub-cabinet officers. You cannot actually <laughs> go to war uh, on day one. That's, that, was, that was still in the Clinton administration. 
And, let, let, and, and now I just wanted to comment on the question of the media, because while I accept your general kind of proposition, I just, as if somebody who was there under the Taliban, I think there are certain points that, that I need underlying. If you reported under the Taliban, you had to live in a certain hotel, you were given a government minder, um, you, you were sort of controlled in some way. It was not a totalitarian state, but it was certainly it was an authoritarian state. Also, the Taliban did not allow media organizations to set up offices in, in Afghanistan, it, with the following exceptions, BBC, AP, Reuters, and AFP. Uh, CNN actually tried to open an office, and there were some negotiations, but never succeeded. In fact, I think Eastern Jordan, um, who was part of that negotiation, may be coming in a second. Um, so, and then, of course, the Taliban banned filming and photography, which takes out a significant part of the press uh, in 97. So doing any kind of news story, at least from a television point of view, is almost <coughs> impossible. I, d I'm not, I don't disagree with your overall assessment, uh, but this was a, a very difficult country to operate in as a journalist, um, and I think that, you know, that's something that should be underlined. Well, and to which uh, the only response I can give as a print journalist especially yeah. is that if they close the doors, uh, they must be for a reason. They're covering something up. If they don't, won't give you uh, permission to set up a, a bureau there, it must be because they know that you will pick up things that they don't want to have come out. So we should redouble our efforts in those circumstances. If they don't want us, I want to be there. <laughs> that should be our principle. And you know, uh, on the whole, it's right. We, this works in Washington. When, they, when, uh, when Dick Cheney closes the door on his energy uh, consultations, you know something is going on there, <laughs> and we should devote every human effort to finding it out. <clears throat> in the case of the Taliban, actually, because people were flowing out of Afghanistan for the longest time, you know, you actually could go to the refugees, the newly arrived, and ask them what for you out. What happened in your home village? What happened in Mazari Sharif? Uh, recon recount the story. And in other words, we there are there are workarounds for next to every obstacle, um, and the best workaround really is just persistence and uh, and, uh, and 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 never giving up uh, because you know they're concealing something and probably something major. Great. Go ahead. Yeah. Roy, one of the one of the lessons. Can you identify yourself? Sorry. Sorry. Bill Goodfellow from the Center for International Policy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One of the lessons that we liberals like to take is that we should be not going alone. Unilateralism doesn't work. We should do multilateral approaches to foreign policy problems. Now, you had a up close view of NATO in Kosovo. Now we're looking at NATO in Afghanistan. And what's your assessment of the <coughs> success so far of NATO or of this multilateral approach in, in Afghanistan? That's going to be working too well. Well, Bill, thanks uh, for reminding everybody of banana diplomacy. Out of print, but still <laughs> relevant in its own way. Um, you know, the uh, problem uh, used to be, it's such a cliche in Afghanistan, is that if you want people to come in on, on the landing, and it may be a crash landing, for heaven's sakes, invite them to join you on the takeoff. And at the very beginning of the <clears throat> engagement in uh, Afghanistan of, of the invasion, basically, uh, this was uh, a go it alone, we can do it ourselves uh, uh, kind of uh, enterprise. <clears throat> uh, NATO offered every possible help. I think, you know, it was a, it was a, a, a great moment, uh, in a sense, in, in the West. Uh, everybody said, we will do what we can to assist you. The British had thousands of men uh, in a, uh, and women, I guess, in a uh, exercise. I think it was in, in, if it was not in South Asia, it was somewhere in the Indian Ocean, somewhere nearby, and were willing to, to uh, send them in. Uh, and they were told, basically, don't bother. Uh, we needed uh, to have uh, all sorts of uh, help, basically, in Afghanistan, and certainly on the Pakistani uh, Afghan border. That whole, the, the, the escape of Al-Qaeda is uh, one of the most vital things that had to be prevented from happening. Um, but uh, the, as I recall, uh, the, the great uh, videos they gave to the television networks, um, the, uh, the uh, Department of Defense was dropping bunker-busting bombs in uh, Tora Bora rather than blocking the way out. <laughs> And uh, they were into high-tech uh, rather than low-tech uh, blocking. And as you know, uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, group uh, escaped. Uh, I forget the exact date, but I once wrote about this for Newsweek. Um, you know, in a very orderly way, across the mountains uh, into Pakistan, and then went to the Four Winds. 
Um, so we basically didn't bring in uh, the help when, when it was first offered and when it would have been most vital and when everybody might have used their imagination to think of what can we do to assist. Um, they, they were basically told not to come. The second thing, and I, I, I don't know if you've seen Sarah Chase's book. Uh, I think it's called The Punishment of Virtue. Sarah, uh, the NPR uh, former reporter, was in Kandahar uh, right at, from, the, from the time the Americans arrived uh, till, uh, and she's, she's still there working for an NGO. Um, and she did what a reporter does. <clears throat> I mean, and this is so basic. This is, this is, this is reporting one to, you know, 101. Uh, she, she, she knew that Afghanistan was a tribal culture <clears throat> uh, and that you have tribes and sub-tribes, you have rivalries, uh, you have I don't like the term warlords. You have local local uh, fiefdoms, though, <laughs> and you have you have people who whose only aim in life is self-aggrandizement and enrichment, and then you have really honest uh, folks as well. So she got to know everybody she could find in Kandahar, um, and 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 came up with her own, her own charts of of who was who there. Kandahar is not a not a minor place. This is where the Taliban had their headquarters, uh, and and this is where we're now having our problems. Well, for two or three years, she tried to sit down with the American military in order to sort of brief them on what she knew. And they didn't want to know. They were at, they, the American military was at Kandahar Airport. Uh, it had perimeter fences, and it had protective uh, de details of Afghans. And of course, wouldn't you know it, they went to some of the worst people uh, in Kandahar <coughs> and, and got them to create a militia, basically, <laughs> to protect the Americans. So we were protecting ourselves from, from Afghanistan. And what the administration basically did, and this is, goes back to Rumsfeld, was they decided that Afghanistan itself wasn't so interesting a place, but it was Al-Qaeda they wanted. They really didn't care about the Taliban very much. They didn't care about the tribal structure. They just decided to uh, do everything we can to, uh, to go after Qaeda. And it just turns out that Qaeda and, and the Taliban began to fuse, and they became very uh, linked to. And that the only way you could get inside of this was through the tribes. Uh, and through, uh, you know, by making, you know, like the British did, like anybody did, and it doesn't always work, is, is making allies, um, turning one against another, you know, doing things in the local culture. It's a long answer. But, but what, what do our allies see? <laughs> and how can they get on board a policy which is based on the lack of knowledge? I don't understand it. I think for, for Gates to sort of go off and, 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 and never acknowledge that the mistakes were ours in the first place. We had the moment. We had the momentum. We had the, ch we had the, the population on our side. We had everything. But instead, because of this single, this almost monomanic approach to unilateral, we know best, we've got the high tech, we can get them, um, we are where we are. You're a reporter, independent uh, journalist, and historian. Um, I, I welcome your presentation of this uh, of this theme, and I think you're, you're giving uh, the public and media a very important <coughs> new uh, perspective on what went wrong on the way to 9/11. Uh, in particular, I, I I think I want to carry just a step further in terms of your indictment of the system, not just the presidents, not the individuals but the national security system as it functioned under both um, the Clinton and Bush administrations. And I'm struck particularly by the point that you made about the JCS never being on board mm. uh, with you know, military um, a strike against uh, the Taliban or, or bin Laden. Um, and it, it reminds me of the fact that uh, Rumsfeld uh, famously said in one of his memos in 2003 that the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, doesn't do terrorism. That's not its function. The Pentagon is set up to fight state enemies. That generates big budgets, big weapon systems, roles and missions for the military. So I'd like to just suggest and, and ask your uh, response to, to the suggestion that, uh, you know, it, that, that your approach could be spelled out more concretely by looking at some of the institutional characteristics of that system and how that played out, almost you know, in a sort of petri dish of the of the issue of Afghanistan. Well, I could say read my book, but <laughs> well, that's I'm unfair. Gonna... <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, Gareth, the, the thing is, uh, if you have a movement 
that ha that attracts uh, people who are willing to die for its stated goals, and a charismatic leader who then appoints other, uh, maybe not quite so charismatic people uh, as his deputies, and has a kind of a chain of succession, um, you know, as, and, and, and thinks he's divinely inspired and convinces his followers that he's divinely inspired. You know, you have more than just simply a single stick figure who you can, um, uh, you know, eliminate from the scene and then his movement collapses. It ain't going to collapse that way. It, it never could. It never would. You have to look at this in political terms. How did he form, form this? What are his, how does he attract people? Um, why are they willing to die for it? How do we counter this? And we have to look at, you know, there might be 10 or 15 or 20 different ways, but the simplistic way of let's assassinate him through covert or, uh, or military operations is not the way. Um, you know, to counter a movement that has taken root to the extent it has, and it's now spreading in Pakistan, it seems to me um, you have to have a broad spectrum um, approach. Uh, you have to think long term. Uh, you have to get the contributions, the wit, the, the, the creative, uh, you know, you think back at the Cold War. It's not as if we told our Western allies how they should deal with Russia um, and the Soviet Union at that time. We gave them leadership, but each of them did their thing. They had exchanges, they had found all sorts of ways that helped undermine basically a system that was corroded anyway. And, and that's what you do. If you have a goal that's a worthy goal that you can convince people is a worthy goal, um, you start off at home with a, you know, with a uh, decision, this has got to be bipartisan, this has got to be long term, this has got to work. And, uh, and then you, you devise your strategy to follow. Um, th this, is, this has been around for years. <laughs> this is something, though, that has to be rediscovered now. Uh, because uh, it has just sort of uh, the, the my I've I've titled my introduction the death of foreign policy question mark, because it seems to me that's really what's happened foreign policy as policy and, and the way I'm defining it actually is the way the military also defines it and almost anybody seriously de defines it it's just simply a process and we in the United States are pretty good at it on the whole when we get our act together <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know the uh, ending of the Cold War in a peaceful way is one of the great achievements of mankind <laughs> in uh, humankind if I want in in um, modern times this is a uh, something that we're capable of doing and leading um, Again, coalition. Who, who else but the United States can actually build a coalition of the entire West and, and then expand the West to include a lot of countries that once were not Western at all, besides us? But why is it? It's because unlike the current administration, we actually listened to them and try to accommodate their interest and then convince them. So it allow the governments of the West who are democratically elected to convince their publics. The whole thing has to, it comes down to, and the fact that we are now in such a kind of, like a tunnel here in Washington where, where the reporters know next to nothing about what the administration is really doing on any major subject, uh, uh, you know, is, is the antithesis of a successful foreign policy. And, and would that it were better under the Clinton administration. It was slightly better, slightly more access, slightly more information came out. But on the whole, the president didn't believe in an orderly <laughs> process um, and, and, and tried to evade things and, uh, and avoid things uh, you know, as, as needed. So I, I, I say this is, this is like foreign policy 101. We, we, just, we, we should just try something that worked uh, and go back to it. Besides appointing somebody Maybe else, just repeat, repeat. <laughs> I'd say I'd say appoint him. Um, I don't know. Look, uh, reporters are not supposed to be giving policy prescriptions. Okay, of course, authors can. <laughs> um, but the reason we don't is, uh, on the whole, and the reason we should stick it, stay out of that uh, is that. Um, you know, you have to think in, in terms of both what the bureaucracy can produce um, and uh, because you don't want to make a recommendation that's not going to actually lead to something. Um, 
but you know, I, I, I guess following on my last answer to Gareth, it's it's just simply let, let's start start by bringing together the best minds um, on bo in both parties and asking them to uh, brainstorm for a while, and uh, and and then picking out the best of the ideas and seeing seeing what they are. But start with the definition of interests. What are our interests in this in this part of the world? How can and then how can we achieve them? But define your goals first, and then figure out a way to 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 get there. So. I would say set up a process, set up a solid process, even if it takes you six months to, to come, come up with it, and then prepare though for, for five years, 10 years, maybe 20 years uh, of, uh, of working at it until you actually succeed. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I'm Diane Perlman, I'm a social scientist <coughs> and um, psychology and conflict studies. Um, it seems to me foreign policy is too important to leave it to, I guess, presidents who have psychological immaturity <laughs> reactivity <laughs> to it. And um, it seems that there should be some kind of body, not even just bipartisan, but say people who study conflict dynamics. And there are other things besides carrots and sticks or coercion and diplomacy, like tension reduction. They're dealing with basic needs, legitimate goals. There are other deeper levels of this. So it seems there should be somebody that's continuous, um, not just when we change administration, that they, hopefully it'll be different this time. And, and just my second hmm. question is, I'm curious, this was a terrific presentation, and I'm curious what reaction you're getting to your book, or if people in the um, field of policy are um, learning from it and responding to it. You know, on the latter, I spoke at the Middle East Institute the other day, where um, a lot of my sources showed up. <laughs> Very scary moment. Um, and uh, they basically asked questions that were somewhat similar to today, and, and they were just simply, you know, did you mention the fact that, uh, that the Joint Chiefs were <laughs> in a different position from the rest of the administration? They basically got it. They, uh, th that's the policy community. Uh, it has not hit the political community so far as I know, and I don't really know, <laughs> with a title like this, how we missed the story. <laughs> I'm not sure how it's really faring in, going to fare in the journalistic community, because uh, we, we don't usually do this kind of <laughs> self-examination either. Um, but there's potential, you know, and uh, look, if there's one thing that it, I would like to have happen is just simply to have the question asked uh, by my colleagues uh, or, or the people who, I'm a foreign editor, so I can even have some of our reporters do it. <laughs> um, you know, let's go back to to uh, the, the 90s. Let's go back to the Clinton administration. Um, what would you do differently? Because Hillary Clinton has an obligation to answer the question, and so does Obama. And, uh, and frankly, uh, so does uh, John McCain. Uh, we should all, they, they, they should be reflective enough people, and they really are, that to have an answer on that. And I, I think it's regrettable that nobody's really put that question to them uh, yet. Uh, but here, but the, the thing is, I think one of the problems was that it was hard, and correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, to actually put that question if you didn't know all the things that preceded uh, you know, that, that happened in the 90s. In other words, what happened inside the government? So I've, I'm hoping that this lays out enough of the narrative and enough of the facts that it would allow reporters to ask better questions uh, of our political leaders. Uh, the first question was... Um, well, I guess some body, including social scientists, to have continuity or to advise changing administrations on... So to um, counteract their any kind of psychological immaturity, the activity, um, two-year-old, actually two-year-old. I'm not sure where, the, where, that, where to lead with that one. Um, look, our think tanks are out there, uh, and, uh, and including this one, uh, and, and, and uh, give people that kind of podium sometimes to, uh, to uh, you know, raise the questions. But on the whole, the psychology of presidents is something that we don't really discover until they're, <laughs> until they're in the office. And there are very few. Uh, but, I, you know, I remember going back to the For Gerald Ford's uh, administration with many of the same people who are now in, in the Bush administration, one of the openest places uh, I've ever uh, seen. People, you know, they would not only answer the phone, but they would feel an obligation to receive you and explain what they were doing. And, and that kept them honest in a way, because they were able also to filter the questions uh, that they got uh, up to the top, and maybe, maybe sometimes the reporters spotted something, uh, or maybe just the, the nagging questions. Uh, you know, they were also good at concealing things. 
uh, and <laughs> which every administration does. But uh, there was a flow, is the point. And if you don't have that flow, and we certainly don't have it now, uh, then the president gets isolated and um, uh, and, and supported only by the, his, the people who are, to a good extent, beholden to him. Uh, and he gets out of the picture. And you can carry on, like in a place like Afghanistan, for, th for three years without understanding that there's a tribal structure there. Uh, but I frankly think that you know maybe maybe reporters could have done a better job on that as well. We we, but I'm not sure how, because the executive carries in foreign policy carries so much, uh, has has so many instruments and tools, uh, which we cannot um, supervise. Now on the whole, in hi throughout um, our constitutional system, Congress has been able to. Uh, make up for the fact for what what say the, the media cannot do because Congress has the subpoena power has the ability to bring in uh, to invite in uh, uh, the administration to defend itself well under uh, when it was an all Republican Congress with a Republican president there was no oversight whatsoever disappeared from the scene and that was just after you know at the time of 9-11 and in, in, in these years when so many things went wrong so Congress failed as well the administration had kind of almost like absolute uh, power in in a what it defined as a warlike situation wartime situation um, that's how we got into the mess we're in because they didn't want to consult but I don't know what we do about it well, on that hopeful note, uh, thank you very much, Roy. And Roy will, there's some books and Roy will sign them outside. Thank you.